it's the Get Air Bridge Campaign Part 10. Last time we finished off the Lugos to our north, but then as we went on to fight the Gutonis up there as well, we encountered disaster, we lost a massive portion of our main force in a devastating ambush, and we also lost one of our territories to them as well. So now it's time to start trying to bounce back from this. The remnants of my ambushed force are safe because our allies took out the rest of the Gatoni's forces in the area. That means we are free if we want to actually advance and go and attack the Gatoni's settlement. There'll be a garrison there and my army isn't in very good condition to do a settlement assault. However, we can still rely on mercenaries on the way, so I thought let's walk over and take a peek at that. We'll also need to start a new army, because the Gutoni's army at Kronos could come down towards Bells and start causing trouble in our neighbourhood. So I've put our king here out onto the field, I can't actually recruit anything this turn, because I've already used up my recruitment in this province, expanding the levy army that I'm harassing the remnant of the Lugos with, which we'll look at in a second. Now here in the next turn I'm grabbing some mercenaries to add to our frontline army. The main thing we lack is melee units, and luckily there were some melee units available here, so now our army is a little bit more suitable for a settlement assault. Just before I did that, I wanted to check out some other things for this turn. Here's that army I just mentioned, the one that's going to raid the Lugos. Now it's bigger than before, and we saw previously the Lugos don't seem to have many troops, so I am planning on advancing further there. This also means I can now start recruiting in Lugia again, and put together a new army to defend Bells. Just going to be loads of German style units because we don't have any get a population around, we have to use all the things that are classed as foreigners, which I think is just the Germanic levies and the Germanic archers. Now here's the settlement assault, the balance bar does not look very good, however because the enemy are defending a settlement I thought maybe we can do something to actually use our cavalry advantage to some effect. The idea was that because the enemy would be so focused on defending the town that they would mostly just be standing around, I could try and aggro and pull individual units out of the town, surround and pound them with all of my cav, and then just go through the entire enemy army doing that over and over again. However, that proves to not be possible because the enemy for some reason actually didn't defend the settlement, they came right out at the start of the battle, so this is effectively a sally now, and my plan doesn't work so well. Not that it's impossible, all I need to do is try and isolate some enemy units, and I've got my cav all over the place as you can see here, seeing if we could get something like that going, but over the course of the battle it became clear that that wasn't going to happen, the AI is actually being pretty good about keeping its units together and not bothering to defend the town, which as I've discussed previously is the correct thing to do in a siege battle where there's no victory point. So, after a while, and after many attempts to draw units away, I start giving up. Looks like my troops are doing the same, they're wavering here, because as they go near the enemy blob, they've got hidden archers that keep appearing and shooting volleys at the cav. After a while then, I just gave up entirely and left the battlefield. We can just withdraw to not take any more losses. Now what I thought this would do, is what it does in Attila, come to think of it, and that is resume the siege. I'm guessing that mechanic did not exist in Rome 2, you can't make a siege attack and then withdraw, and then just still be making the siege afterwards. It does count as a defeat instead of a draw like it does in Attila, and that means you have to fall back from the siege. We also lose a unit because it applies the cutoff of every unit below 15% strength or something gets killed because technically you lost, so a bunch of guys who weren't even involved in the fight just died. That was nasty, and we can't make another action this turn. So everything has gone wrong with this attack, I think it might still have actually been possible to get somewhere in that battle, but clearly I didn't feel like trying. So now I can just do it again in the next turn, in that I can resume the siege and perhaps just leave the siege going if I really wanted to, to try and siege them out, but I decided not to bother. Because of the Gutoni's pressure coming from the east, I thought it's probably better to go back because we might actually need to recapture parts of Lugia again very soon. So we'll go back for that. I've also told my ally to go after the Gutoni settlement instead, so they might finish the job for me. And you can see the Gutoni's main force at Kronos is on the way in, so there is now another timer before something potentially bad happens. To try and stop them, I'm putting this army together, as I said, but we are severely limited by the lack of get a people. I can have two good units and the rest will just have to be levies and we don't even have time to get a full army of levies together against the enemy's regular force, so potential difficulties there. 
In the meantime, here's that army that I said last time I was going to use to attack the guys who were just to the south here, the whose name I never remember. But actually I walked through their territory instead, in order to support the attack on the Lugos, because now we can get a definitive advantage. I've got this big stack of spammed levies, and combined with the actual troops in the second army to the south, we have a perfectly respectable chance of taking the Lugos down entirely. So that's what I'm going for here, hiding the levies up north to hide my power level, and we'll see what happens. During the end turn sequence, the Suebos declare war on our ally. These are the guys up north where the Lugos used to be attacking us from. I'm going to have to drop this alliance because there's no way we can be involved in this war. And that does mean my plan to have my allies attack the Gatones will now not happen, but I'm still going to ignore that territory up north all the same. Now the small Lugos army comes over to attack my guys approaching from the south. We could just retreat here and potentially draw their army away from the settlement and out of their region so that my hidden army can just finish them off. However, I thought this might be a bridge battle because we are standing next to a bridge and you can't actually stand on bridges in this game, so standing next to them is usually the criteria to trigger a battle, but the fight kind of has to be across the bridge space on the map for that to really happen. So no, we get a land battle and I'm just going to fight it anyway to see what happens. In this first bit of the fight I was just moving my troops away from the line so that I could have some space on my left to deploy out the archers for a flank attack once the enemy swarmed onto my front line. But actually, they did just stand around quite a lot and throw jabs at me, and this aggroed me in a particularly bad way. I decided to send my line forwards to try and get the fight going sooner, hoping that would cause fewer javelins to be thrown at me. However, this totally messes up, the units don't move at the same speed or anything, and so we end up fighting outflanked here on our right. Luckily, the cav come in to support. But actually, it wasn't the flanking that was the problem, it was the jabs all along. Because here we see my unit, as it engages the enemy, is dying extremely rapidly. Over the course of 10 to 20 seconds, we're going to be losing an entire unit of hoplites here, and it's just because these javelins throwing at what is being considered close range are really powerful, even though they're throwing them less powerfully to make this attack. That's just how Rome 2 works. It used to be that having archers right behind the front line was one of the most powerful things you could do because it would counter shooting at point blank range as they practically just threw their arrows over the front ranks. Anyway, so that means our unit in the center gets obliterated real fast, and that's bad news for the units on either side. The unit next to them gets surrounded and routes, so now we're going to lose like another whole unit there. This is really bad news actually, this very boring and standard battle is suddenly turning into a disaster. Over on the right I've got my cab cycle charging and they're trying to do some damage. My archers are supposed to be supporting over here, but I spent a lot of time trying to get them to not stand on top of each other. If you give attack orders they tend to rotate and things and start standing on top of each other, so micromanaging that means they end up not firing for a while, but when they do start firing they'll be more powerful, so we need to try and leave them where they are now. So our centre is gone. Our left is just our elite hoplites who don't rout under the pressure, but they are under a lot of pressure, they're being attacked on three sides with the line defending their only unattacked side. Handily, my archers nearby have been ignored by the enemy, so we can snipe the enemy's general there. We're going to gradually take some men out of his unit, and my general is coming over as well to do something similar. On what remains of the right, we've got just one unit left that's fighting like five enemy units, that's not ideal, but here we do get a nice rear charge on the enemy general and start killing his bodyguards. We also at the same time rout the unit that was behind our elite hoplite, so that takes the pressure off a little bit. That general runs away and we'll come back to him later. Now the hoplite have a nice easy fight to the front against just one unit that's probably worse than them. Over on the right, our archers are gradually thinning out the ranks of the enemies who are swarming my hoplites, and somehow this unit didn't rout like the other ones. It got attacked on three sides, but it somehow held on. That means it's holding the enemy units in position for my archers to keep shooting at them, and they'll gradually start racking up the kills. So this ended up working out okay, those units are getting battered, and on the left we took out the one enemy unit attacking my hoplites, we routed the enemy general with my own general, now there's just one unit left over here, my archers are currently in melee with them, but we can get out of there and then put our elite hoplites into that fight instead, we can probably win that fight, especially with the archers there to support meaning we just need to finish off this blob. They're already thinned out in terms of numbers, I think one or two units have already routed out of it actually, just from the archers shooting in, and now we can start cycle charging them with the heavy cav. The presence of the general also stops our unit from routing, so we can keep up the attack with the archers. 
and gradually we take that blob out. One unit tried to escape at the end there, but they'll just be pelted down. Our cav will slaughter the survivors trying to get away nearer to the center. And off goes that unit fighting the Hoplites at the end. So there we have it, we won that battle, but this very innocuous looking battle turned out to be surprisingly challenging. And I think it was all because I should not have moved the Hoplites. I think standing still in shield wall is probably the best way to deal with being jabbed to death. You probably get jabbed to death a bit less than if you move up and get into a melee where perhaps your ranged block chance doesn't count or something. Anyway, there's the Gatoni's force still making its advance towards us, so the clock is still ticking there. At least we can make something a bit better of this Lugos situation now, because first we can besiege the town with our levies. That'll stop a garrison being involved in this fight right here, where we have a massive advantage and can finish off the survivors from the last battle. However, I immediately realized I've made a mistake, because I've got a unit in my army that's probably already under the delete threshold. Taking part in a battle means they'll just be deleted no matter the result. So there we go, we managed to throw away one of my units, could have merged them into another similar unit before to come away with a few extra troops. But whatever, we carry on after that fight to just do the same thing again, only this time our big army counts as reinforcement, so we absolutely slaughter them. That also kills an enemy champion as well at the same time. Now we could go on to attack the town, I can't really remember why I didn't, but what I did do instead is a nice sieging trick. I put all of the troops in the army that's not conducting the siege. That means only the one general will receive the siege attrition, and if the enemy sally, we basically still have our forces together because we can just pull them all in as reinforcements. So I guess I was waiting for the enemy to sally because nothing else is really going to change there. Although we are going to come back to that actually, in a little bit. Looks like my main force is very slowly coming home, they're definitely not going to arrive in time to participate in any defence against the current Ketoni's invasion. Now with regard to that invasion, I realised that this turn they're going to walk towards us and cross the bridge into the Bells region there. So I realised we could go for a bridge defence to enhance our potential power. However, the army we have is pretty small, so even with a bridge, we don't have a very good chance of holding it. You have to hold at least two crossings, so we need more troops than this. So I decided to try a sabotage on their army, and while that had a very low chance of working, it actually did work, and that reduces their movement range. So now they can't cross the bridge this turn, and we're on. Now we can go stand on the bridge and recruit some more units, so that we'll have something a bit more suitable for doing this strategy next time. In particular, we need a couple of cav units to do some outflanking maneuvers, and some heavy spears are always good for sitting on bridges and not letting the enemy pass. So overall, Pretty nice that we got that delay, because here we are in the next turn and they've barely moved, we've got more time. And I thought, well, we could just keep doing this, if we sabotage them again, they might still not be able to cross the bridge, and then we'll have something approaching a full army defending the crossing point. However, we get the opposite result, the also very unlikely event of the spy becoming wounded happens, so now we just don't have a spy, and they are going to be in range of us this turn. That's a shame. However, while clicking around randomly here, I realised something. I realised that if I shuffle my army like one pixel to the north, I'm considered to be in reinforcement range of the town. The question is, is that position enough to trigger a bridge battle if the enemy come over to attack me? Will they cross the bridge and then attack me first? Well, there's no way of knowing, of course. These annoying bridge battle questions seem to be vexing me a lot in this campaign recently. But we just leave that situation to see what happens, and now we're coming back to the Lugos siege to do what I probably could have just done in the previous turn, and that is just go in to make the assault. The balance part isn't very good, but we have actual units versus garrison, so that morale advantage is still there. Plus, this time, the garrison does actually commit to defending its position, which is great because my army has loads of archers, making it perfect to exploit an AI who's not willing to come out of the town. We actually missed the uh, first couple of units of killing because I forgot to press the button to be filming this replay. But anyway, seeing it done once is enough to get the idea here. We're just moving up to the town with our archers. The enemy are mostly focusing on defending set positions. So we can shoot them with arrows and they won't react. Well, that said, they will do one reaction. The AI, once it's decided to defend a point, will usually try to defend it with the strongest unit in the area. So once you kill a few enemies, the unit on the point turns around to be replaced by another, which is great because while they're moving backwards, they're super vulnerable to arrow fire and you end up getting way more kills on them this way versus if they just stood there and took the arrows to the front. 
Anyway, so we just shoot them for a while. I've got the Dacian archers attacking from the north and the Germanic archers from the southwest. The Germanic ones, I've mentioned before, are better, and here's one of the main reasons. They have maxed out armor penetration on their arrows. So that just means there's a much reduced chance that the damage on the arrows will be reduced when they hit enemies. The way armor works is really complicated and it's RNG based as well. But basically, armor penetration removes some of the RNG and means if you hit the enemy with an arrow, they are guaranteed to lose some health, whereas normally an armored unit isn't guaranteed to have anything happen to them when they take attacks. So, over a period of time, we do start thinning out the ranks of the defenders. They have three or four units of archers themselves, but they tended to come out on their own and we can just focus them down with our own archers to get rid of them. However, we don't have enough arrows to actually take out the enemy army with this method. And furthermore, they did eventually get bored. You can trigger the AI into going into offensive mode. So after a while, they came out to attack me. You can see I've already pulled my archers back to beyond the flank of where this new battle is going to take place, where they can pick up some more easy routes this time, not shooting into shield. So they'll actually be more powerful in this scenario than they were just doing a regular advance into the town. Up north, you can see nothing's happening. That's because I'd put my archers back behind a ridge line, which removes their line of sight on the town. So while it looks like nothing's there, I thought the enemy were still there and I was just waiting around ready to come back to that situation and continue shooting at them. But after a long time I was like, I'm being attacked a lot in the southwest, so many units keep coming out of the town, where are they coming from? And I cottoned on to the fact that actually there's probably nothing defending the north anymore and yes, the AI had completely committed everything to attack me over here. So I was very slow to pick up on that. But eventually my troops will rush through the town and now we'll be able to rear attack the army and the big blob sitting in the streets behind the army like so. Our cavalry are making charges but the streets themselves are the enemy here. The presence of the buildings and all of these corners means charges don't really build up and it's harder to get something good going. Especially when the enemy are all blobbed up together because your men sometimes make contact with troops from a different enemy unit to the one they're targeted onto, which cancels charges and means you can't do charge bonus attacks against the backs of the blobs in general, but it still has the same morale effect. Plus, once my archers come over and start shooting into these enemy blobs, they're going to be nice and vulnerable, especially where they're facing the other direction. Looks like they're turning around on the spot here, unsure what to do about this situation, and I guess they're right to be unsure because there's no way out, they're getting pretty surrounded and they're getting pretty pounded by this arrow fire. After a long time, we're able to rout everything. We actually lost uh, one or two of our levy units doing this because while the enemy were in melee with us, they were better than us as it turns out. Our Germanic levies are quite bad in melee, we just have lots of them and they're cheap. And they did the job, they held the enemy for the couple of minutes required for us to get that heroic victory against them. So overall, a pretty tidy result the entire army's gone we didn't even lose any full units and now it's time to do our new favorite trick we'll sack the place getting some cash and advancing our bonus objective and now we can just also liberate the place which will still spawn a new army which will be our ally and now be defending our border all good stuff with that done i wanted to check for the faction destroyed confirmation and there it is the lugos are down. That was a long and in some places quite difficult war, but it seems we have somehow prevailed in the end. We can now also extort the new Bowie Confederation by making them pay me for a trade deal. As for the army, I'm actually going to go south with it rather than going back to help in our defence against the Catonis, because I still wanted to get involved in my Scordisci allies war down there, so we'll come back to that in the next part. For now, let's take a look at this. Here comes the Gatoni's force. And yes, it does look like that would be a bridge battle because we're fighting across the river on the map. But more importantly, the balance bar is really far in our favor. And that's because the garrison is indeed in range and is apparently strong enough to give us this good balance bar. That means we can actually auto resolve this one and get an okay result. I was hesitant with this 70 something percent remaining force idea but then I thought wait a minute most of our losses will be among the garrison and nobody cares they just respawn plus we're in our own territory so some of the losses on the main force will respawn as well especially where it's just levies who are easy to replenish so there we go that is what we call an anti-climax I ought to resolve that battle after all the build-up to it and it was a great ought to resolve I must say most of the losses were among the garrison, which as I said doesn't matter. The enemy got completely wiped out with just their general and, and their king, in fact, escaping. 
and of course we now go through a turn of recruitment and replenishment, meaning in the next turn we're stronger than ever. It was also winter, so I didn't pursue them, I just went up to the border and kept recruiting. This will mean when spring comes about, we'll have a full army to push forwards and start a counter-attack against the Gutonis. Obviously they'll be able to recruit things, and it's going to take us a long time to move up through Kronos and then all the way up to their other place further to the north. So this is no guaranteed win in the war, but it's a great start. So in the next part, we'll start covering our new campaign against the Gatonis, and we'll take a look at my intervention in that Scordisi war, and some sneaky measures taken there to overcome the fact the enemy have a substantial advantage against the forces I'm sending in. So join me next time for all that. <laughs>